All right, I think it's a little in alphabet, so we can jump in. Um, and again, my name is Evan. I head up the commercial team here at BuzzSumo. We're really excited to have you here today, and I'm lucky enough to be joined by Paul Ratzer. Um, Paul is the founder and CEO at the Marketing AI Institute. Now, before we jump into the webinar, I just want to spend a quick minute or two talking about who we are at BuzzSumo and what we do. You can think of BuzzSumo as your all-in-one solution for creating content, managing your PR, and media monitoring. And what we do is we pull together trillions of different data points to bring you actionable insights. And I talk to customers sometimes on when they have their cameras on, they can see. When I say trillions of data points, people's eyes gloss over sometimes because they think, okay, that's just more data for me to sort through. That's more jobs for me to do. I'm already really busy. That's absolutely not what we're about at BuzzSumo. What we do is we leverage that data to bring you actionable insights to help you do your job quicker and do your job faster. So if you're someone who looks for journalists to reach out to, does that manually, we're gonna help you find the right journalists in just a couple of minutes using really easy to use tools backed by those trillions of data points. If you're someone who has to manually sort through all these mentions of your brand, maybe even find the mentions of your brand, we're gonna find all those mentions. I promise we find more than anybody else and help you understand which mentions are the most impactful. Um, help you break out the snippets that mention you and help you build insights quickly. Um, if you're someone who has to sort through, wants to understand what's trending in your space, you have to sort through Twitter and all these different tweets. We're gonna make that really easy. We're gonna build, we can build a trending tool for a trending feed for you, I should say, just a couple minutes to help you stay on top of your industry, your space, your brand, your competitors. So again, the goal of BuzzSumo is to help you do your job better and quicker. You don't take our word for it. We have all these fancy badges from G2 you can see on our screen. And we're lucky enough to be mentioned by all these great influencers and thought leaders in the space. These are people we worked with on previous webinars, worked with on projects and case studies. And a few are just unprompted tweets, which are always just fantastic to see. So if you haven't tried BuzzSumo before, just make sure you go to buzzsumo.com. You can sign up for a 30-day free trial on our website. There's no gimmicks or gotchas in that trial. It's just 30 days. We don't even take your credit card. What we want to do is give you a fair chance to understand if BuzzSumo is right for you. So to jump back into why we're all here today, um, I'm someone who talks to a lot of marketers and the number one topic on people's minds right now, I should really say the only topic on people's minds right now is AI. All I hear is AI, AI, AI. And it's a really exciting topic. It's been for a while, a really interesting topic and it just exploded with the launch of ChatGPT. So it became clear to us a couple of months ago that we wanted to do an AI focused webinar. And once we realized that we knew we had to reach out to Paul, um, because Paul literally wrote the book on AI. Uh, aside from that, he's someone who just constantly writes great thought-provoking pieces on their LinkedIn, on their Twitter. He's 100% a thought, the thought leader in my mind in the space. And he's someone who's been at this for a long time. Just talking to Paul, he told me he found the AI Marketing Institute in 2016. So he's not someone who just hopped on the trend the last couple of months. Paul's the real deal, and he knows the space better than anybody. So I'm really excited to hand over to Paul. But before doing that, just a, two quick pieces of housekeeping. If you have any questions, please pop them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. We're going to save some time at the end of the call to get through as many of your questions as we can. And we're also recording this call, and we're going to send out a copy uh, of the recording and also copy the decks in the next couple of days as well. So you'll be receiving that in your inbox if you signed up for the webinar. All right, without further ado, Paul, over to you. Great. If you want to stop share, I'll go ahead and switch over and share mine. All right, we good, Evan? You see it? Looks good. Everything's good? All right, perfect. All right, let's roll. So this is Intro to AI for Content Marketers and Communications Professionals. And as we were talking about up front, there's so much chatter about AI these days. The interest has skyrocketed um, as a frame of reference. The Marketing Eye Institute's website traffic in January is up almost 100% over the previous year. Um, Podcast downloads are up 800%. Our Intro to AI for Marketers class was up 200% in January. So if you are all of a sudden jumping in to learn about AI, you are not alone. Um, the data points would back that up. So as I was saying, though, we, we've kind of been at this for a while. I started researching artificial intelligence in 2011 um, because I thought that it had the potential to transform the marketing industry. And at the time, no one else was talking about it. So the only way to go learn about this stuff was to actually go read uh, books about AI from AI researchers and machine learning engineers and 
um, kind of the thought leaders within the space and then try and connect the dots to what would happen in marketing and sales and customer service. So for the last 11 years, we've basically been looking ahead and saying, okay, this is gonna, there's going to be a moment where everything changes and the marketing industry transforms. And I feel like fall of 2022 was probably that moment, or at least everyone um, became aware of what was going on, at least at a surface level with chat GPT, million users in the first five days by the fastest growing technology application in, in the history of, of, of humankind. So we are all now aware that AI is a thing, uh, that it is going to impact our industry, our careers, our businesses. Um, but the challenge we see now is the vast majority of marketers, of business leaders have almost no baseline understanding of what artificial intelligence actually is. Um, they have their experience with chat GPT as the basis for how they think about artificial intelligence. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about chat GPT. We're going to talk about specific use cases in marketing, specifically related to content marketing and communications. But I want to start with a little uh, baseline of kind of where we're at and what the opportunity is moving forward. So the, the, I've been using this slide for like five years, um, but this, I think, is probably the best way to level set where, what, this go, what is going on in AI. So your life is AI assisted. Your content marketing and communications will be too. If you look at all of the applications and technologies on this slide, none of them are possible without artificial intelligence. So for years, you have been using artificial intelligence dozens of times every day, from Gmail finishing your sentences to Facebook curating your newsfeed and targeting you with ads, Spotify making predictions about music you would like, uh, having conversations or at least asking questions of Alexa and Suri. Um, personalization of TikTok and other social media applications, all of these things are made possible by artificial intelligence. And most of them have been developed within the last decade. So another slide I've been using for years that's never been more relevant than it is at this moment. Uh, this illustration comes from a blog post that I believe was published in 2018 by Tim Urban called the AI revolution. And I've always felt it was the best representation of what was going to happen with artificial intelligence. That if you look at that little stick figure at the bottom of that exponential curve, that is the moment we are in. The, the rate of change you have felt, even with the advent of ChatGPT, is nothing compared to what is about to happen. So the rate of innovation within artificial intelligence, which then trickles into all of the marketing and sales and service software we will all use, is going to be almost incomprehensible. Um, so 10, 20, even 100 times the rate of innovation we've seen in the last year, you're going to start experiencing at increasing levels. So again, it's very hard to put into words what is about to happen in marketing and in business, but I think this chart at least gives a, a sense of that feeling. So again, the, the chat GPD conversation, we can't have any talk about AI or marketing these days without chat GPT. So if you haven't seen it in, in the animated uh, GIF here, you're seeing the building of a chat GPT prompt. So how should businesses prioritize which AI pilot projects to start with? And within seconds, we have you know, an output. So in this case, AI is you know, the software, the machine. We're giving it a prompt and it's generating output. So this happened on November 30th of 2022. It came out. Within five days, we had a million users. And within seven to... 10 days, we had uh, thousands of AI experts flooding Twitter and LinkedIn, um, telling everybody what AI is and how to use it. So what I like to call the overnight AI experts who used ChatGPT GPT for a week and thought they understood AI. This is a problem because um, there's a lot, of, a lot beneath the surface of how ChatGPT works, how the language models that power it work. And so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on all of that today, but I want to, one takeaway I want you to have is chat GPT is only the beginning. So if this is your experience with AI, you are just at the surface level. There is much more that exists today, and there is way more coming in the near future that you should be very much thinking about in your career and in your company. So this is an excerpt 
from a blog post that Sam Altman wrote. If you don't know who Sam Altman is, he is the CEO and co-founder of OpenAI, the makers of ChatGPT, as well as the makers of Dolly 2, which kind of took the world by storm with image generation last year. Uh, he wrote a blog post called Moore's Law for Everything, which basically meant uh, exponential innovation, like a growth curve of exponential innovation through AI. And you can see here what he was doing. It, what I always say is like, if you know where to look, you can see the future um, ahead of time. And so if people had read Sam's blog post back in 2021, he was tipping their hand at what was to come. So it was believed for decades. So AI research goes back to the 1950s. This is not new. Um, but the breakthroughs that we're seeing today started happening around 2011 with this thing called deep learning, which I'll explain in a moment. But basically around that time, AI researchers realized that all this academic theory of what AI could eventually do was starting to become reality, that there had been some innovations that were going to make um, new capabilities possible, specifically in, in vision, computer vision and, and language, which is what we're seeing now. Um, but it was believed for decades that AI was first going to come for manual labor that we would lose jobs related to uh, manufacturing and things like that. That hasn't necessarily come to fruition. I mean, it is infused within manufacturing processes and manual labor, but what Sam was sort of alluding to here um, was that it's actually the knowledge base workers that might get disrupted first. And so they were basically saying what they knew at the time, because within their research lab, they were doing things and not just them, but Meta and Google and Microsoft and Amazon and NVIDIA and all these other players in the space, they were having breakthroughs in the ability for AI to generate and understand language, to understand and generate images and videos. Now we weren't seeing it yet as consumers, but they knew that we were approaching these breakthroughs that would be released into the public. And so he was starting to set the stage that AI was going to be able to think, it was going to be able to create, it was going to understand, it was going to have reasoning capabilities. And these are major transformations in not just in marketing, but in business and in society. And so this is the stuff that I don't think the vast majority of marketers or business professionals or leaders are aware is even happening, um, but it's been happening for the last 10, 11 years. And so to really understand the impact and what's going to happen in content marketing and communications and PR, it's important that people start to understand at a deeper level why these things are happening and how they're happening. Okay, so that's kind of like the macro level. Now we're going to get into very tactical things and very actionable stuff for the, for the rest of this. Um, so my general belief is that we are in the age of intelligent automation, that at least 80% of what marketers do every day will be intelligently automated to some degree in the next three to five years. I, I'm uh, actively considering updating this slide to the next one to three years, um, and I might make it 100% in the near future, um, because I do believe AI is going to be infused into every aspect of what we do as professionals in, in the very near future. A key takeaway, though, is because by this point, there are usually a lot of people that are fearing for their jobs. Um, what I will tell you is that AI, I don't believe, is going to replace you, but the people that use AI will replace the professionals who don't. So there's a lot of professionals, especially, I mean, I, am, I graduate with a major in public relations through a journalism school. So I, when I say things about the communications and the PR profession, know that it's coming from um, an, a deep understanding of that industry. I ran an agency for 16 years before I sold it um, in 2021. The communications and PR industry, historically speaking, is three to five years behind the rest of the marketing industry in terms of innovation and adoption of new technologies. That cannot be the case here. Like the, the communications and PR industries have to more rapidly seek knowledge and adopt AI tools um, because they can be obsoleted way faster than historically speaking. Um, at a high level, one way to think about this is what is happening at the major organizations. So Microsoft, it was recently um, discussed, is putting another $10 billion into OpenAI, again, the makers of ChatGPT. So Microsoft has their own you know, thousands of AI researchers at their company. They have a partnership with OpenAI. Google has tons of AI technology, thousands of AI researchers, Amazon, same, NVIDIA, Salesforce, Adobe, all these major tech companies have been investing in AI for over a decade, if not two decades. 
they believe it is the most important thing to ever happen to society. Uh, this is a quote from Sundar Pichai, the CEO of Alphabet and Google. Um, he has said this multiple times. This wasn't a one-time uh, soundbite. This is a talking point he uses to get, try and give context to the importance of artificial intelligence. So as these major tech companies are pushing AI forward, it's creating the necessity for a next generation of marketers to emerge. Now, when we say next generation, I'm not talking about age banded. I'm not saying this is the students coming out of universities. It could be people that are 30 years into their profession. I don't care. They just embrace the fact that this is happening. Don't ignore it. Don't pretend it's going to go away. And they seek ways to apply smarter technology. In other words, AI powered technologies to their careers and their companies. Specific areas this can happen is thinking about the personalization of experiences, the things that we expect as consumers, those frictionless experiences with all these consumer technologies we use, that that same experience level is happening in all aspects of business and marketing and communications. AI unlocks massive creative possibilities, and we're going to talk about some of those today. And then it can help you achieve goals um, and, and drive efficiency and revenue growth at unparalleled levels. And so for the, like, the marketing agencies or the professionals that adopt this stuff and race forward, the peer groups won't be able to compete. Um, and, and I'll show you why in a, in a minute. So, but my challenge to you is you can become this, like you can be a next gen marketer. You can do it today. Like once you leave this, if this is your first introduction to artificial intelligence, you're going to have knowledge and resources to go start taking actions right away. This is an excerpt from our book, which came out in, in summer of 2022. This is we're in a rare position to, to create change and reinvent what it means to be a marketer. A key takeaway for you is you don't have to go back to school for this. You don't have to like data. You don't even have to be tech savvy to use artificial intelligence. You just have to realize that there is smarter technology to do everything you do as a professional and find the ways to do it. So let's kind of level set of what is artificial intelligence. It's always helpful to have a, a base understanding here. So my favorite definition is that AI is the science of making machines smart. Think of machines as software. So the software you use to do your job, whether again, whether it's communications, PR, content marketing, or, or other, um, think about the software itself getting smarter. So right now, the only way you get better at your job is to learn something new and go apply it. And then you buy software that helps you do your job. That software doesn't get smarter. It doesn't make recommendations to you. It doesn't predict outcomes. It's not helping you evolve and be more efficient as a marketer necessarily because it's continually learning. That's what happens with artificial intelligence. The software, the machine learns. As new data comes in, it learns what to do next and makes recommendations and predictions. Kind of a simple way to think about it. So we consider marketing artificial intelligence the science of making marketing smart, that it's no longer all human all the time. There are machines assisting you in doing your job. So at a very high level, think of artificial intelligence as an umbrella term for the tools and tech that make machines smart. Machine learning is a term you hear all the time. This is a very literal definition. The machine, the software, learns. So it's machine learning. Data comes in, like if you send an email, open rates, click rates, what time did they open? How many times did they open? Uh, did they convert? There's all these data points. The machine takes that data in and then improves the next email that goes out. Maybe it recommends a new subject line or changing send time, whatever it may be, but the machine actually learns. And that can be applied to all disciplines within marketing. Deep learning is a subset of that, which is trying to give the machine human-like capabilities of, of sight, of language generation and understanding, of movement, um, of reasoning. So deep learning is the breakthrough that happened around 2011 that is enabling a lot of what we're seeing today with language generation technology. So let's look at some specific examples here. So when I think about the main categories of artificial intelligence and what you're going to see in your career, there's three main applications at high level, language, vision, and prediction. Within language are all these kind of sub applications. So natural language generation is what we're seeing here in Google Smart Compose. It's generating language. This is what uh, ChatGPT does. And what's happening is it's actually trying to predict the next word in a sequence. It is not copying and pasting from a previously written document. It's not going and grabbing a citation and then just dropping it into it. It is running through what are called large language models to make predictions around words based on its learning. That's, so that's what you're seeing all the time. That's how ChatGPT does what it does. 
Text summarization is becoming a really popular thing. Something you use all the time when I think about it is speech to text. So if you use Zoom and you transcribe it, you're using otter.ai to do transcription. Translation is a huge one here. So anywhere where words are created and the machine needs to understand those words or words are generated or analyzed sentiment analysis, I know as one that BuzzSumo plays in. So if you're doing media monitoring and you need to do sentiment analysis, realistically three to five years, it was terrible. It's getting really good. Um, so that is where one of these breakthroughs and a lot of these language breakthroughs happened in the last like three years. So that's why we're starting to see a lot of this emerge today. Here's a tangible example of some of the use cases. So this is from Jasper. If anyone's uh, tested that AI writing platform, uh, they raised 125 million series a uh, in, I think it was October of last year. So, um, you can see though, like writing blog posts, summarization, Q and a, give me some questions to ask about a topic, add headlines. These are all use cases for writing tools, um, all made possible by artificial intelligence, by natural language generation. So I'll go through more use cases in a minute, but it just starts to give you a sense if you haven't really uh, dove into this space, all the potential applications that exist for this. Now, vision is, a, is one that wasn't as obvious until the middle of last year when Dolly 2 came out. So if you haven't tried Dolly 2 yet, it's an image generation technology from OpenAI. The one I'm showing here is called ImageGen from Google, which has not been publicly released. Google has taken a much more conservative path to releasing its AI technology um, because there's restrictions, one, because they're a bigger company, uh, two, because it can be misused. So even the stuff that OpenAI has come out with, they have, OpenAI has chosen, chosen a very aggressive release path where they are releasing technology that they know can be misused but their preference is to put it out into the world and learn from it and then try and put the guardrails in place after the fact or on the fly. Google has generally taken a path of they need to get all the guardrails up before they release things. That is about the change. OpenAI has kind of forced the hand of a lot of larger tech companies, including Google. And while Google still plans to focus on responsible AI, the reality is they're going to have to probably release some of their technology faster than they originally planned. So 2023 is going to be wild because Meta and Google in particular are probably going to start releasing technology that they're sitting on in their labs right now that is as good or better than what OpenAI has previously released. So image generation, video generation is a huge one. Um, you're gonna see the ability to generate videos with text prompts, the same we're seeing with image generation. So uh, as communications professionals, as content marketers, your ability to create content with AI is going to explode. Um, there's gonna be thousands of tools you're gonna be able to use to do this stuff. Practical example, when I did my marketing AI conference keynote, our, our conference that we run every year in the summer, uh, I built the deck using Dolly 2 images. Every one of these images here was generated with a single text prompt. I didn't edit it, this was like first try. Um, the one on the bottom right is a human and a robot watching the sunset, like as an example, photorealistic, I think is what I said. So you basically just give these prompts and it outputs these images and, and then I just built them in my presentation. Prediction is, um, is kind of going to be the underlying capability of everything we do. So if you think about what you do as a marketer, you're largely making little predictions all day long. Like what subject line is going to get somebody to open this thing? What lead paragraph should I use to get them to read the rest of the article? What image should I choose? Everything you do, you're trying to make a prediction about what is going to drive someone else to take an action or create a behavior or emotion that you want to trigger. And so a lot of marketing is actually about making predictions. We just don't think about it that way. And anywhere where predictions are made, AI can probably assist. So personalization, recommendation engines, those things are going to be um, everywhere in marketing. All right, so let's get into some common use cases. The best way to think about identifying if you have a use case for AI is to think about these three variables. The first is, is the task I am doing data-driven? So stay with the email marketing as an example, or well, let's go to content marketing. The If I'm trying to figure out what uh, subject line or headline to use for a blog post, I can just kind of use my instinct and experience of what I think is going to work, or I can go look at the data. I can pull some BuzzSumo data. I can analyze it. I can go through and try and figure this out based on data. Um, the next one, is it repetitive? Do I do the same thing over and over again? So like when we publish a podcast at the Marketing AI Institute, 
there's like a 17 step process we go through, including transcription of the audio, summarization of the transcription, um, analysis of the audio, improvement of the audio quality. Like we're using AI and probably seven out of the 17 steps in our podcast process. So you start to look at these repetitive processes and say, okay, can we infuse AI into these to make them more efficient? And then are you making a prediction? Now it doesn't need to be all three of these things. It can be one of them. But if it is any of those, then you may have a potential use case. So if we think specifically about content marketing, on the left, there's some, some example use cases. So analyzing existing content, we use market news to do that. Automating co copywriting, you know, Jasper, Go Charlie, Writer, WordTune, HyperWrite, you know, phrase, take your pick. There, there are literally dozens of these AI writing tools right now, including directly through OpenAI. Um, language translation, recommending content. So there, there's hundreds of content marketing use cases. To give you a sense of how fast this space is moving, this is an October 17th tweet from Sanya Huang, who's a partner at Sequoia. They had identified 30 generative AI tools in October. So again, this is pre-ChatGPT. ChatGPT came out November 30th. By October 24th, a week later, they had now identified 100 generative AI applications. A month later, CB Insights got into the game and they had a 250 vendor um, map of generative AI tools. This is well over a thousand by now. I mean, there, there's gonna be 10,000 of these things in 2023. So this one, I zoom in a little bit because you can start to see like social media and marketing content, voice synthesis and cloning. Like if you're in PR, you have to understand how easy it is to synthesize the CEO, to create a synthetic version of your CEO. Like, we are, if you're in PR, your crisis communications plan has to include ways AI can be used to damage your brand because it is a massive amount of potential use cases you have to deal with. So, I mean, the, the need to understand this stuff well beyond ChatGPT, especially in communications PR, is so critical not only how you're going to use it, but how it can be used against you um, because it's going to happen. And there's gonna be a lot of high profile cases of it happening. So the whole point of this is this space is exploding. There's going to be thousands, if not tens of thousands of generative AI tools in the years ahead. If you haven't actually seen what it does, you know, I showed the chat GPT example earlier, but here's an example of OpenAI also has a playground where you can go in and it, this came out before ChatGPT, but you could go in and actually like play around with their GPT-3 or 3.5 technology. And so you can see here, I'm writing a blog post about how marketers can get started with artificial intelligence. This is real time. This is not sped up. So you're looking at, what does this take? About 40 seconds. Um, first, it generated 269 words. I hit submit again, and it ends up going to about 440 words, I think. So there's some settings on the right I'm not going to get into right now, but the temperature basically is how creative the output is. So right now it's writing things that like what it thinks are the most likely words it should be saying. If I adjusted that temperature, it might get more creative. The key here, if you are in content marketing, this post was written for about a penny. So the way it works is you pay for tokens and you can think of a token as like 1.3 tokens equals a word. So this is 440 words, about 570 tokens. It costs me about a penny to write it. Now I'm not going to publish this post, but I could definitely use this as a first draft. And then I could go through and make edits to this post. This is what AI writing tools enable. So whether it's ChatGPT or Jasper or Writer, or whoever it is, they're basically enabling some form of this. I give it a prompt and it writes a thing. In communications and PR, again, there's dozens of use cases. These are just a few examples. So analyzing media coverage, my first job out of college was at a PR firm and I used to do build media lists. Uh, we would photocopy out of Bacon's, like it was, this was back in the day before we even had like online directories. Um, and then we would make photocopies of media coverage and we would build massive press books. So, you know, when I say like, I understand the origins of all of this, like I had to do this for a job. So analyzing media coverage, writing copy, speeches and video scripts, like the AI is getting pretty good at writing that stuff, um, tailoring media pitches to individual uh, journalists, social media content, newsletters, brand influencers, all this stuff. And again, there's, there's just dozens of these things. Um, to just experiment. I had never done this before yesterday, but I thought I'd throw this in there. 
So I, I went back into OpenAI Playground and said, let's write a press release about uh, a new event that we just announced. So earlier this week, we announced the AI for Writers Summit as the Marketing Institute event that's coming March 30th. And so all I did was said, write a press release on, and then I gave it the URL to the Writers Summit. So here is a press release. And again, real time, no edits. Uh, starts off, not bad. Marketing Institute announces AI for Writers Summit. That is factual. San Francisco, California, that is wrong. There is nothing on that page about San Francisco. It made up that the city is in San Francisco. Um, a virtual event taking place July 1st to the 2nd, 2020. Also wrong. That is an incorrect date. Uh, it goes on to say featured speakers such as Google, Microsoft, and Adobe. Also wrong. So my point of this is AI writing tools are fantastic assistants. They can help in many ways. There are some pieces of content they are very good at. Getting facts correct is not one of the things it does well. This is a perfect example. It is going to make things up. It'll make up dates. It'll make up names. It'll make up whatever, because it's not copying and pasting from anything. It's original text based on its prediction of what the word should be. So it's a very important thing. You can't make decisions around your content strategy and team, assuming these AI writing tools are at the point where they're just going to write everything for you because you will get an output like this. Email is another one. Uh, we all do email, whether in communications, PR, marketing, whatever. Um, it, there's tons of tools in e email. So if you do a lot of email, just assume there's smarter technology you should be researching. Okay, um, how do you get started? And then I'll end with a few final thoughts and then we'll go into Q&A. So there's two main ways we teach people to get started. The first is a problem-based model and the second is a use case model. And I'll I'll, I'll talk through these for a moment. So in the problem-based model, it's a bigger play. You're thinking about assuming AI can maybe help you solve them more efficiently. So an example, let's say our email database, database has grown 25% year over year, but open rates are below industry average and our contact customer conversion rate is steadily declined. And we know the value to solve it. If we can get a two percentage point lift, then we can generate another 100,000 in sales. And then you go through this kind of 10 step process. Um, this is in our book, there's a chapter on this. So if you're interested in learning more about how this works and all the detail, just go read chapter four of the book. Um, the use case model is where you probably are gonna start though. You could go do this today. Um, so in this one, you're looking for quick win pilot projects that are very specifically defined in scope. And I'm gonna show you a chart of, of how to think about this and that you have a high probability of success with, because you don't wanna go wasting a bunch of time and money on a bunch of AI projects and nothing works, and then you can't get support from the C-suite to do anything else. So in this case, you look at what you do every day, your kind of tactical uh, role, and you say, okay, what if AI could help me do this? And so here's an example specific to content marketing. So this is a, a workbook. This is actually available for free on our site. There's a, a template you can download on our book page. So I, I believe they threw the book link in there. If you go to the book link, you can actually um, scroll down halfway on the page and there's a free template you can download. So I, I customized this one for content marketing though. So you can see use cases, uh, analyzing existing content, keywords and topic clusters, buyer personas, um, scroll down, uh, translate English language eBooks into multiple languages, write blog post draft, transcribe podcast audio into text for publishing. And what you wanna do is make a list of all of these things, all these use cases and say, okay, how often do I do this? Or does my team do this? How many hours a month are we spending on this? What tech are we currently using to do this? Or are we not even doing it because we don't have AI tech that can? How much are we spending? And then the key here is what's the value to us to intelligently automate this? So if you have something that is not that critical to your team, so I, I have, uh, you can see a two in red down there, transcribe, uh, translate English language eBooks into multiple languages. So if you're saying like the instance, like we just don't have that audience that would demand that kind of content, so it's not hugely valuable to me to do that at the moment because we don't have the audience for it. So I give it a two. It's like, okay, this isn't a huge priority. But if we go up and say, recommend highly targeted content to users, we can say like, we're spending 20 hours a month doing that. We don't even know what we're doing. We're just guessing at what people are gonna wanna read next or what event they're gonna wanna go to next. If AI could help us do that and be better at predicting what piece of content to recommend next, that could be huge. It could drive revenue, it could drive audience growth, it could create a better user experience. So that's a five to me. And so what you do is you just kind of create this quick list and you go through and just real, you know, subjectively say, oh, what do I think the value is? And then the second one is the ability to automate. And that basically says, do we, is there tech to do it? And do we have the money for that tech? 
and we have the people that can execute it. So again, it's a, a kind of a simple way to think about getting started, but it's a, a th again, something you can do in probably 30 minutes. All right, a couple of thoughts on buying AI tech. The key takeaway here is AI is just smarter technology. This is why anyone can do this. If you are the domain expert in content strategy or content production or content promotion or PR or communications, then you're probably the best person to assess the AI technology because the way you do it is you do user stories. My job right now is to do these 10 things and it takes me hundred hours a month. If I can find AI technology to help me do half of this more efficiently, I can save 50 hours. And so you're gonna be the best one to look at a tech and say, okay, I, I like your tech. I like that you're using AI. Here is what my, my life looks like today. What will it look like once I buy your technology? How is it going to actually make me better at my job, make the process smarter? The challenge here is that the majority of the logos we see in this massive MarTech landscape from Scott Brinker and Chief MarTech, majority of these vendors have no AI in their platforms or very limited features of AI. Honestly, the SaaS industry has been way slower to infuse AI into their software than I expected. Um, I thought by 2022, 2023, SaaS companies wouldn't exist that weren't infused with AI across everything. And that didn't happen. That didn't come to fruition. I think we're now at that point. I think ChatGPT changed a lot of things for SaaS companies also. It was a wake up call for CEOs at SaaS companies that they maybe had software that was a bit outdated. So I think in the future, we're going to see a lot more AI infused into our marketing and communication software, but it hasn't been as quick as I thought it was going to be. What you're looking for when you're buying AI is how is it going to make me better? How is it going to drive efficiency in what I do? How is it going to improve my performance? And the key thing you're asking is once I, once I have this AI technology, use ChatGPT as a tangible example in your mind, what is the machine going to do? And what am I, the marketer, still going to do? So we created this marketer to machine scale to help visualize this with level zero being probably where you're at today with most of your stuff. It's all you, all marketer, all the time. You do everything. The machine doesn't get smarter. There's no recommendations being made to you. It's not predicting outcomes. It's all about you. Level one, mostly marketer. Two, now we're half and half. Three, mostly machine. Four, you just give the machine a goal and it just does the work for you. The reality is most AI software you will buy is level one or level two. Level one is probably the most common. And that's not a bad thing. That, that can actually make a major difference in your business and in your career. I would say level three is probably possible. I, I could probably listen to an argument that some form of language AI tool could get you to level three. Um, level four does not exist. And in my opinion, shouldn't exist. Like it, it shouldn't be a goal of SaaS companies to be building uh, software that remo removes humans from the loop. Um, so I, I wouldn't have that be an expectation of where this is going. So the thing you want to think about is how is it going to reduce my cost? How is it going to increase my revenue? And then how is that software going to keep getting smarter over time? And uh, the, the, the takeaway again is a little bit of AI, level one, level two, can go a massive way to reducing your costs and driving revenue if you have the right data and the right use case. Final thoughts. So where do you go from here? Um, you may be sitting on this webinar thinking about your own personal transformation. You're trying to understand AI, trying to figure out how you're going to use it. Uh, maybe you want to play a role in adopting it within your organization, but maybe you're not even a director level. Maybe you're maybe only been there for a year. Or maybe you're the intern. I don't know. But you see the potential of AI and you're trying to figure out ways to infuse it into what you're doing to advance yourself and your organization. And that will then determine what you do next with this information. If you are a leader within the organization who's being expected to solve for your team, it's going to change the way you think about this and what you do next yourself. So you may be looking at how I improve my team's productivity. How does it affect our hiring? How does it affect our internal training and upskilling? How is it going to transform the organization and customer experiences? And so you want to be thinking about that. And I always guide people like think first about comprehension. If all you know about AI is that you can output things in ChatGPT, that is not comprehension. That is a single tactical tool that is a basis to create curiosity to get you to go figure the rest of this out. Comprehension is understanding how this stuff works and the breadth of what it's capable of doing. Competency is being able to use the tools to teach other people within your organization how the tools work, 
why they can create value. Mastery is sort of aspirational, but it's like, how do we get to the point where we're so confident in this that we truly can become a change agent within the organization? So next-gen marketers know that in order to deliver personalization and experiences that modern consumers expect, marketing has to become smarter. It must become marketer plus machine. My guidance to you is don't wait for the world to get smarter around you. Don't wait for all the software to get smarter around you. There's plenty of tools out there now that can help you become a change agent and become a next-gen content marketer or communications professional. And with that, I will stop talking and turn it back over to Evan and stop my screen share so we can get into some Q&A. I see lots of chat. I haven't been looking at it, but it looks like chat has been active. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Paul. That, that, that was amazing. There is a lot to think about. And uh, yeah, there's definitely a lot going on in the chat and a few questions for us to answer. So I'm going to share my screen. And let's jump into Q&A. All right. The first question is this one popped up pretty early. I thought it, was, I thought it was pretty interesting. Paul, you did touch on this a little bit, I think, but what does the talent pool look like for staff equipped to effectively pioneer AI exploration in SMBs? How likely is it that you need to upskill or is it more likely going to be new hires? It's almost non-existent. Um, so this is what we've been doing at the Institute. We've been trying to create AI savvy marketers. Uh, with the idea that there would come a day, which I think is now arriving, where their demand for marketers at all levels who understand AI would dramatically increase. And we're, we're starting to see this. Like I'm getting outreach from heads of marketing at major companies asking about who do they hire sort of stuff. I'm heading back to Ohio University in two weeks to do a visiting lecture series um, to the communications and business schools on this topic and talk about kind of edu higher education, how we can better prepare students. So what I would say is in the very near future, um, your best bet is to upskill your existing team because you're not going to find these people elsewhere. We launched a piloting AI for marketers course series, a certification course series in mid-December, just pilotingai.com. That is designed as a step-by-step -step learning journey to do this exact thing. It's about eight hours of content. So basically you can learn AI in a day. Um, it's the most comprehensive thing I know that's on the market right now. So I would say if you're looking to go deeper and to do your team, you know, get your team, check that out and reach out to us if you have questions and we're happy to provide some like advice and guidance in this area. Thanks. And I, I think, you know, the flip side of that, not the flip side of that, but part of that too, is if you're someone who's a marketer right now, if you're an individual contributor, it's a massive opportunity for you. So it sounds like to me, huge, to be within your company and become the go-to AI person, because it probably doesn't exist. And there's not they're, someone they're going to come looking. And that's why I've always said, I've said, put on, put this on LinkedIn like a month ago. I said, you want to create disproportionate value for your company and in your career, be the one that when they come looking for someone to lead AI projects, knows what they're talking about. <laughs> like be the one that can stuff. It's like, yeah, I actually know what to do. I've been testing these three tools. Boom. Like career path, just it's going to happen. This is going to be the year where companies are going to come looking on some people on their team who understand this stuff. Nice. Uh, and again, take take that step past just using chat GPT. Yeah. Uh, another question uh, popped up. What about AI ethics? And that's a fairly broad question, but we're talking about creating content using AI. You know, a topic I see come up a lot is that AI is beat on machine learning from crawling other web sources. So what do you see as the ethical component of creating content assisted by a tool like chat GPT or Jasper? It, it's a, a very important question. It's a, it is a broad uh, question, but I think the um, there's a couple of ways I look at this. One is it starts with an understanding of what goes into this stuff. So there was this uh, post I put up on LinkedIn on Saturday that has like 230,000 impressions, like the most popular thing I've ever put on LinkedIn. And it was about um, uh, the how the AI works and, and the identification of AI generated content um, specifically related to you know higher education and things like that. And in that case, you're talking about ethics of I'm going to publish things and I may or may not say that they were generated by AI. Um, CNET got busted for this last week. There was another high profile case where they were generating content that they weren't telling you was written by AI, but it was written by AI. So that's an ethical determination of like, are we going to write content with AI and are we going to tell people it was written by AI? That's, that's one thing. Then you can get into the training data. So chat GPT, there was a big thing that came out last week about how it's trained to not let awful things 
be generated. <laughs> um, what I would guide without going too deep on this at the moment is you should, uh, as, a, as an initial step, you should be thinking about a policy uh, for the responsible use of AI and the types of vendors that you would work with with AI. So if, you're, if you are a leader in your company, as you're looking at pilot projects, I would simultaneously be figuring out who needs to be in the room to develop a responsible AI policy for the organization that can clearly state how you will use these tools um, and kind of what the guardrails are. Well, that's, that's really helpful. I think it's, it's a very in-depth topic you probably talk a lot about, but I think that's a great summarization of how to, how to take an actual step towards that. Yeah, I mean, we could, we could do a half day on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, a good, interesting question. Does Google detect content that is AI generated versus human written and rank search results based on that? And my, my take on that, and I'm curious what your thoughts are on, on that, Paul, is that Google's constant quest is to find useful content. And they're constantly updating the algorithm to do that. Do you, do you, how do you see that playing out with AI? It, this is a, um, a, a moving target, kind of a, a, a rapidly developing area. The short answer is in August, Google came out with a helpful content update where they talked about, um, yes, that the, the, the main thing is, does it help someone? Does it create value for a user? But they also very specifically said that it should be written by humans. So um, there is going to be a never ending race for the generation of AI content and the identification of whether or not AI generated it. There are tools emerging right now that claim to be able to identify if it was written by AI, but they're probably spoofed pretty easily. You can make some tweaks to the AI generated content and get rid of it. Um, I, I think the best thing to do here is to take a responsible approach to using AI tools. Assume that you should make decisions around transparency and authenticity. If you're going to use AI in your blog, you should state this is how we use it. If you're going to generate an article straight up that's written by AI with no editing, you should say so. Uh, I think we should just err on the side of transparency as an industry and not get into a bunch of, of uh, can we game AI, the, the Google algorithm for a few months before they catch up on it. That's, you're not going to win that game. All said. Uh, another interesting question is, what do you expect AI to influence regarding marketing sales in the sense of, would you be open about the use of AI or keep it from the client as there's still some level of skepticism of AI? And I think particularly what this question is driving at was we see those AI video tools that can, um, I try to think of the name like Synthesia that yeah. have a you know an AI avatar uh, read your content. Uh, how do you see the success and evolution of those going in the short term? Um. My my kind of mid to long term assumption is we will have laws governing all of this. So I I've said multiple times recently I think Sam Altman will have his Zuckerberg moment in front of um, the U.S. Congress Senate, uh, where he's going to be grilled on what language models are and how they how they work. I think in the U.S. we'll have state laws that will enact first, where you have to disclose if you're engaging with an AI agent. Uh, Europe is ahead of us um, in the U.S. for sure with their AI Act and, and the work they're doing over there. So I think that you have to move forward under the assumption that there will become regulations around this stuff. And I think taking the most humanistic approach possible to how you use AI is, is the best path forward with or without those laws in place because they will come. So I think specifically around software companies and their AI I think you have to understand your audience. Do they care about the AI or do they just care about the outcome? This has been an ongoing debate. I've had this conversation with SaaS companies for years asking me, should we talk about our AI or not? And I've always advised, you have to know your buyer. You have to know if they care. You have to know if it's a differentiating factor. That doesn't really change in the marketing of software. But my general sense is we are going to, in the near future, see more AI savvy buyers who are seeking AI technology that they know is differentiated from what they've traditionally used. And I think in that case, the AI messaging is going to become more critical. The problem is most marketers and brand people at these SaaS companies have no idea what AI is either. So you're asking people who don't understand AI to create the messaging around AI, which is a recipe for confusion. Really interesting. And again, there's lots of questions coming in. So we're going to get to a couple more. 
I wish we can get through everything because this is such a great topic. Um, let me just pick one. I'll, I'll do one while you're doing it because I've been seeing this. AI isn't plagiarism, is it? Question mark. Like that's a really important one. Um, no, it's it's not because if we think about when I go back, went back to how the language models work that are powering ChatGPT, they are not copying and pasting anything. They are not pulling from a direct citation. It is original content based on its training data, which in the case of ChatGPT is, is the internet. So it is writing original content um, that you would not be able to run through a plagiarism checker and find. It's going to pass plagiarism checkers almost every time, 99% of the time. That doesn't mean you shouldn't edit it and change it, but it's not reproducing existing content. Interesting. And, and there's, here's another tough one, a little bit of a curveball I'm going to throw at you to get back to these kind of big yeah. in-depth questions that we're, we're asking for a short answer to a very in-depth question. The expansion of AI will affect jobs in one hand and opportunities for people on the other hand. You know, what impact, I guess the driver of the question is asking, you know, what impact do you think is going to have in the job market for marketers um, in the sense of, you know, dec maybe declining opportunities or increasing opportunities or re-specialization, things like that? I've, I've always been a believer that the it'll be a net positive effect on jobs that I think in the long run, we will have entirely new career paths emerging that we can't even imagine at the moment. I mean, I could sit here and theorize what I think some of those are going to be, but AI is going to create all kinds of new jobs that we can't imagine. I think that the near-term disruption to knowledge workers is going to be far greater than is being talked about. Um, I don't know that that's going to be because the AI actually takes jobs or because undereducated executives make knee-jerk decisions about staffing because of what they think AI is capable of. So you're going to have boards and, and um, stakeholders investors who are demanding efficiency uh, and reduction of costs. And they're going to see chat GPT and other AI tools and think, well, we don't need all those people. Let's just have AI do it. And that is a misguided decision, but I think it's going to be made over and over and again, especially in media uh, and publishing content for sure. So yeah, I think it's going to get messy in the near term. Yeah. That's a lot of food for thought. Very interesting. <laughs> There's always short-term cycles and long-term cycles, and we got to be aware of both. Um, this is going to be the last question, and I'm going to summarize um, thematically a lot of different questions are written about SEO. And what people are asking about is both, can a AI have an immediate application to SEO? Um, I'm sure there's some tools out that you may be aware of. And what's your view on the long-term narrative? I think we're all hearing that AI is going to e upend how SEO works by providing an alternative to like the uh, tools like Google and the sense of how Google works right now today? The, so the short-term answer is yes, there are tools on the market right now that can do the most of SEO for you. I, I think SEO as a profession is one of the ones that is at the um, highest probability of near-term disruption from AI. Um, short answer. The, the, the more complica complicated answer is we're, we're, hypothesizing based on what SEO looks like at the moment. And there is a very real probability that within the next 12 to 24 months, search and SEO look nothing like it looks today. That if you really want to know the impact it's going to have, you have to have a lens into the future of search. And I'm not so sure that there are very many people outside of Google maybe being um, open AI who could intelligently uh, predict with any level of accuracy what we're going to see in the next 12 months. But I can promise you it's not going to look like what SEO looks like today. Awesome. Paul, th thank you so much. Um, and everyone, we try to get through as many questions as we had. This was- There's a lot. Yeah, I mean, a <laughs> uh, clearly very engaging. I think it's probably the most engaging one we've done based on the questions we're seeing. Um, again, we're going to send you a recap video. We're going to send you a copy of the deck. Um, but Paul, thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. Um, and we're also hosting another webinar next month, February 22nd, with Luke Cope, um, who's from Bottled Imagination, who's someone we've, we talk to a lot, even internally. And he is going to talk about how to pitch creative ideas 
that actually gets signed off on. And Luke's someone who has had a lot of creative ideas and fantastic marketing campaigns that I've been really impressed by. I don't want to have, share any spoilers for what he's going to share next month, but make sure you go to buzzsumer.com slash webinars and sign up today um, so you can join this webinar as well. And again, Paul, thank you so much for being here. Everyone, thank you so much for joining. We're so happy you chose to spend some time with us and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.